So Professor Richard, Richard Kern is a professor of French at uh, the Berkeley Language Center at the University of California at Berkeley. He teaches courses in French linguistics, language, and foreign language pedagogy, and supervises graduate teaching assistants. His research interests include language acquisition, literacy, and relationships between language and technology. He's an associate director, or associate editor of the LLT, an editor, that's language learning and technology, an editor of the teacher's forum section of L2 Journal. Professor Kern has published several books as well as articles in journals such as the Modern Language Journal, Foreign Language Annals, Canadian Modern Language Review, Studies in Second Language Acquisition, and TESOL Quarterly. His recent books include the co-edited volume, and this is in French, and I know how to do this. <laughs> it's Décrire la conversation en ligne, le face-à-face -face distanciel, co-edited together with Christine Develotte and Marie-Noël Lamy. And a book on language, technology and literacy, Cambridge University Presses. University Press. He has other recent publishers, publications. Are we ready? I'm not quite. Okay, not quite. So I get to read the next paragraph. <laughs> right? It's called Ad Living. No, it's not. It's on here. The recent, uh, other recent publications include The Development of Literal Literacies with Paige Ware and Mark Washauer in Rosa Manchon and Paul K. Matsuda, a handbook of second and foreign language writing. Um, there? We're almost there. Right. So his talk for the symposium is titled Integrating Literacies Past, Present, and Future. Does that do it? That's do it. All right. So, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't, does this, does this mic here work for broad, can I speak loudly like this? Can you hear me if I speak uh, like that? Okay. Okay, we're just seeing if this, yes, it comes up, okay. So uh, we're just waiting for an extension cord. As soon as I get, can get plugged in, uh, we can be, uh, get going. But um, I will just start off by giving you uh, an overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, the first half, the talk will be in two parts. The first part will be the sort of the setup, uh, giving you some background uh, that makes the second part a little bit comprehensible because the second part is um, my current thoughts uh, of putting together ideas to, to ground a, a general approach to language education uh, that is design-based, and so the, the first part of the talk is going to be talking about design uh, and a model that I've been working on, uh, and I would be very interested in uh, any of your thoughts on this because this is a uh, work in progress. Even though this particular work will be going into publication, uh, I still consider it uh, a work in progress, um, and I would really like to... Um, propose that the principles that I've come up with are just my particular uh, you know, thoughts on this, but that there is nothing uh, that, that says that these principles are the right ones, uh, and I'd be very interested in uh, getting your take on that. I'd like to thank uh, Chantel Warner and John Reinhardt for inviting me uh, to this conference. This is really, I think, uh, the kind of, the, this hybrid conference is probably the harbinger of the future. And so uh, my hat is, if I had a hat, I would take it off to you guys. Uh, it really uh, is an exciting uh, format. Uh, I'm very eager to hear about the kinds of interaction that have been taking place. Uh, I'm very excited about the potential of you guys writing an article uh, about this because I think it does uh, you know, as conferences get more and more expensive uh, and as uh, people who don't have uh, university funding to attend these conferences cannot participate fully, this is exactly the kind of format uh, that does allow some of those obstacles to, uh, obstacles to be overcome. So bravo for, for having organized this. 
uh, as well to all of the Circle team for having succeeded in this cycle of refunding to the Title VI Center. That is a major, major <laughs> accomplishment. So wonderful, wonderful news. I'm glad that you can keep doing the wonderful work you've been doing. OK, I want to start off uh, by talking about some of the ways that technology and language are related. And there are two principal ways, as I see it, uh, over time. One is etymological. So uh, when we go back to the Greek, techne uh, has to do with art, craft, know-how. Uh, logos, of course, meaning words or discourse. Uh, so what uh, technologia originally referred to was the systematic treatment of grammar. It wasn't until the mid-19th century that technology came to refer to science and mechanical and industrial arts, which was really about the transformation of raw materials into finished product, products. And I like the idea about transformation of raw materials into finished product because that ties in very nicely with the New London Group's uh, idea of available designs uh, and then who, which get redesigned uh, through meaning-making processes. The other connection is not etymological, but practical in the sense of writing. Uh, when writing was first invented, uh, at least some 5,000 years ago, uh, and this is in about four or five places around the world uh, independently of one another, uh, but we know most about the Sumerians and, and cuneiform in terms of early writing. We have the most uh, artifacts because being on clay, this is material that's very durable and in fact gets more durable as fires uh, come through and, and ravage temples and so forth. Uh, so uh, this is uh, really significant, I think, uh, in that uh, language is now made usable across time and across space. Up until writing, you always had to be within sonic uh, distance of other people in order to use your language. Now, with writing, it gets preserved, it can be looked at, uh, it can be used as records, and in fact, early writing did not uh, get used for language so much for communication as much as bookkeeping. That was the, the primary uh, function of uh, early writing. And I want to talk just a moment about uh, the material dimensions uh, of, of this. Uh, and how this uh, impacted how cuneiform writing. Uh, on the left there, you have three different types of styluses. Uh, now, originally, when, when people started writing on clay tablets, they had pictographs. And so if you look at the uh, character for mushin or bird at the bottom left, this is the Sumerian word for bird, it was written as a pictograph and it looked like a bird. Well, they found out that there were a couple problems. First of all, clay did not uh, hold uh, lines very well, especially curved lines. And also, in the hot desert climate, once you started writing, the clay hardened very quickly. And if you spent a lot of time drawing pictures on clay, by the time you got to the bottom, you couldn't write anymore because it was already hardened. So they had to devise a quicker way. And so they experimented with different styluses. The middle one is where you would poke in and you would have holes and they use that for quite a while to indicate numerals. We're going to see a, a tablet with numerals in just a moment. But then the one that really uh, clicked was this wedge-shaped reed that you could just poke into the clay. So instead of drawing with it, you would poke. So the effect that this had was where you had curved lines, you would have now straight poke lines. Circles became squares. Uh, and uh, this made things much quicker, so people could actually write and finish their text by the time it dried uh, at the end. And so you see at the bottom there that by 2400 BC, you have a radical change. You can still, now this is left rotated by, ni by 90 degrees, but it, uh, and that's because they changed the orientation of the writing from vertical to horizontal. But if you rotate that, to the right, you'll see a vague resemblance to the original sign, but now it's very abstract. And abstraction was one of the things that made writing possible. Okay, so here's a tablet that illustrates the ambiguity of writing. So texts were ambiguous right from the very beginning. This is not a modern phenomenon. 
So uh, th this uh, text is, can be interpreted as two sheep delivered to the temple or at the house of the goddess Inanna, or it can be interpreted as two sheep received from the temple of the goddess Inanna. The idea is that the, because these were bookkeeping devices, they didn't have a graphic syntax. So you just put the elements that you wanted in a square, and it was the reader that would make sense of it because the reader knew what the transaction was. So the idea was that you were not presenting some form of meaning that was completely decontextualized. You were communicating a record to someone who was present and just needed to be reminded of the transaction. So this actually was very clear to the people who were using it. It's ambiguous to us because we were not partners in those transactions. Now another thing um, that's interesting here is that, that if you look on the far left, that star-like figure uh, is a, a, a semantic determinative, uh, which tells us that this is, we're dealing with a divinity. And this is one of the things that sort of deambiguates things when you can put determinatives. But it also is the name of the god An. So again, we're not sure whether this is saying that Inanna was a goddess uh, or whether it's talking about the god An and Inanna, who may or may not be uh, a goddess. So again, uh, some uh, ambiguity. So ambiguity, yes, but that was OK for the social system that was in place. So much later on, uh, this, this led to the development of social codes. Now here you have the first dictionary. This was about 1500 uh, BC, uh, a uh, Sumerian dictionary. Um, and you now have a sense of how this writing uh, is used as a broad social resource for not just the people who wrote it or the people who were there, but to a much broader audience. So now there's a shift in the social function of writing. Today, everything is now coming, being synthesized in the computer. All these different types of media that we used to work with, whether it was tape recording that worked with sound, or paper and pencil that worked with writing, uh, or with um, film uh, cameras, uh, on acetate. Now everything is in zeros and ones uh, on and digital devices. The nice thing about this is that there is this opportunity for convergence of media, lots of easy ways to transform uh, media through algorithms. Uh, what I think we've lost a little bit is this sense of how we, how we treat the medium as part of the communication because the medium is so multiple in the computer. This really is a multi-system device. So uh, the, the metaphor that we're going to be talking about this afternoon is one of design. And if you haven't read the New London Group's uh, 1996 uh, piece on multiliteracies, this would be a good uh, uh, background on this notion. I'm not going to go into uh, that because I think many people have read that already. Um, but the, the gist of it is, is that all meaning making involves design, which involves drawing upon existing resources, available resources uh, that then, uh, and, this, and this drawing upon these resources takes place in specific contexts. And these contexts uh, have various scales. Uh, they, are, they involve spatial dimensions, they involve temporal dimensions, they involve cultural uh, dimensions. And so meaning making, design of meaning is a very relational process. And so some of the things that come into relation are the material resources we use. So for example, pens and pencils, film, computers, recorders, uh, etc. Uh, language, of course, is a huge uh, uh, device, but I'm going to put that under the social resources because even though there is a material dimension uh, to language, it is the social dimension that is crucial, along with all kinds of things uh, having to do with social conventions, genres, ideologies, cultural attitudes, all affect the ways 
that technologies are taken up and language is used. Also, individual resources. Uh, as individuals using language or creating meaning, we are always drawing on conventions, <coughs> but depending on our circumstances, how much time we have, how much energy we have, where we are, what resources are available to us, we're going to use language, we're going to design meaning in individual ways that take those circumstances into account. Our use of language and technologies is also going to depend on our imagination, our creativity, our emotions, our aesthetic sensibilities, and so on. So all of these come into play. And of course, all of these interact with one another. The, the material resources that we used are realized as technologies because of the social resources that we bring to them. And social resources are in turn always, or, or, or very often at least, mediated by uh, technologies. Um, and sometimes uh, these material resources can uh, create new social realities or new social entities. So for example, when you have the development of online communities with people who have never met one another face to face, but they are in fact a community, this is something that's been made possible by uh, a material resource uh, that didn't exist before. Other, in other cases, so for example, Facebook, um, you're not creating a new community, but you're extending a face-to-face -face community uh, in new ways by adding a new dimension. We can, we can talk face-to-face, -face, but we can also share on Facebook, and the kinds of things that we share on Facebook are likely to be quite different from the kinds of things we, we share face-to-face -face and so forth. Um, so just to do a very quick um, set of examples of some of the ways that, that these things happen. So here's the, uh, an early Chinese text. The reason why Chinese was originally written in vertical columns was because it was originally written on bamboo strips. And so the materials that were used, then when it migrated to paper, the convention was already established. So there was a material reason in the first place, but then it became a social convention. And so when they started writing on different materials that no longer required a vertical column, they used the familiar format that they were accustomed to from uh, bamboo days. Uh, this is um, in, in Asia, you have interesting differences in writing systems. Uh, so Devanagari writing you have on the top left there. You'll notice that this Mitra line, uh, this is a horizontal line that, that connects characters. Now, um, so this was you know, Sanskrit and, and uh, uh, Hindi, Marathi, uh, all use this Devanagari uh, script. Now, in, in southern India, southern Asia, when they tried to use the Devanagari script on palm leaves, because palm leaves were the main medium. In the north, it was bark, stone, wood, uh, very solid materials. But in the coastal areas, they had palm leaves. What happens when you use this horizontal line through the palm leaf? It splits the leaf. So we need to develop a new writing system. And so if you'll notice on these other, here you have a palm leaf uh, in the middle. Uh, this is uh, Tamil. And you'll notice how curved the uh, script is. That's to prevent the palm leaf from splitting. Now here you have Burmese on the bottom. This is not written on palm leaf but the rounded script is, preverb, is, is, is preserved because that was the, in the development of the script, it was during palm leaf uh, medium days. And so that has uh, continued. Let's take a look at a road. When you're riding along, you see this kind of thing. Now this is very odd. I mean, if you don't, I mean, we're all used to this because we see this all the time. But you know, if you're studying English, for example, you know, what is Xing Ped? It sounds like Chinese, you know? So what's going on here? Well, we have multiple systems at work because, you know, first of all, we've got you know, the use of the icon for cross. You know? So this is not a linguistic thing. This is iconic. But then it's followed by a linguistic suffix. So we've got already two different systems. And then we've got an abbreviation for pedestrian. OK, 
So, but then the order is weird. Now it's saying crossing ped, crossing pedestrian. Well, the idea is that when you're moving in your car, I've never gotten this logic, but these, <laughs> these road paint designers always do it this way. The first word that you come to is supposed to be the one you read first because you're moving in space and that's the first one you're going to encounter. So you have ped crossing. Okay, now if you put this on a sign, you get the normal order. You get, you know, ped crossing because now we're reading this all on one plane and we're approaching it all at the same time. So it makes a lot of sense. Now, when we're driving our car and, you know, we see in our rear view mirror, ambulance or sheriff, it makes perfect sense because this is designed to be viewed through a rear view mirror. But when you look at a, in a parking lot and see this, it seems backwards. This one I love where you've got taxi. Now, if you flip the taxi around and you look at the driver's side, it's written normally, T-A-X-I. But on the passenger door, it's written I-X-A-T. Any ideas? Kristen? Where the driver's side switches? So that you, if you're coming from different countries, you'll know where the passenger Well, the, the, yeah. If you go through like in a road and you have like uh, shops, you yeah. can see the names, like it's like a mural. Oh, because it's reflected in the, in the <laughs> oh, I'd never thought of that one. Wow, brilliant, brilliant. The only thing I've been able to think of, and, and this, I don't know whether this is accurate or not, is that um, because you are moving from front to back, as the, as the taxi is moving through space, that this is reflecting the movement, that on both sides of the car, you start with the T, then you go to the A, then you go to the X, then you go to the I, as it's moving through space. Now, if that's the case, it's a very different cosmological sense of how space and writing operate. Uh, but I think it's fascinating because you'll find this uh, throughout uh, Asia. And many taxis will have this with the right-hand door being spelled backwards. Okay, now another dimension is the individual dimension that I noticed, that I mentioned earlier. And so here you'll notice that you've got a standard sign, do not enter, but it's been inflected by a personal mark that leaves a trace on us as we see it. Uh, some of the things that, that I've noticed, you know, in my neighborhood, there's a car with a sticker uh, that says Carpe Skiam. Okay, so Horace never imagined this coming out of Carpe Diem, but lo and behold, with language play, people understand this. But when do people understand this? They understand it when it's written. Well, first of all, you have to know Carpe Diem. You have to know that expression. Okay. But then, if I walked around and just said, carpe skiam, carpe skiam, <laughs> you'd think I was nuts. You wouldn't have any context whatsoever to interpret what I was saying. But when you see it on a bumper sticker, and when you see it as the monthly e-zine of the American uh, Birkbeiner Ski Foundation, and you've got snowy trees, it makes perfect sense that you're going to go for it on the slopes. Uh, the middle one, uh, does everyone recognize that? OK. Prince, okay, with the artist formerly known as Prince, this, this, this goes back uh, to, to 1993 when the artist uh, decided that he would drop the Prince uh, name and he said, this is my name. It is an unpronounceable symbol, okay? And the idea, and what he said was, uh, its meaning has not been identified. It's all about thinking in new ways Tuning in to, written as a numeral two, a new free quincy. So the idea was to break convention, uh, and then all kinds of, you know, uh, there was all kinds of speculation about what this derived from. I mean, there was, there was, you know, well, this is alchemists' uh, symbols, and and this is about Prince's transformation, you know, uh, as he's going from one alloy to another. Or this is combining male and female uh, symbols. Uh, and this is, uh, there's a horn 
uh, there. So, I mean, all kinds of speculation about what, the, you know, the, the artist said, no, no, this is, you know, you can speculate all you want, but this is what it is. Uh, uh, another uh, example of individual uh, use is uh, lead speak. Is there, does, does anyone practice lead speak here? Okay, so we've got some, some okay, so what's the goal in lead speak? Well, well, first of all, you guys can't read it, but someone who doesn't know lead speak, can you read this? It's English. Anyone? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're the, you're the experienced one. See, <laughs> Jonathan is an in-group member. And so, <laughs> so, but this demonstrates the point is that you guys aren't supposed to be able to read this easily. That's the whole point. If you can read it easily, then it's back to the you know, scratch board and trying to develop a new system. But the idea, OK, so what, you guys, what, what's the rule in, in lead speak? What's, what's the principle? You can't use the actual. Right, OK. So you're writing in English, and you're writing in English script, but you can't use the letters. So you have to disguise them somehow. So this says, I have had full conversations in lead speak. OK, so, so once you know what it says, you can start to vaguely see the shapes. It, it gets a lot easier when you're just seeing it cold. But Jonathan got it just like that. He just read that as if it was right out, out of the program of the conference. So again, it's a question of what practices are you already expert in? OK, let's take an example of the at sign. So in 1971, a uh, computer engineer named Ray Tomlinson was inventing what we now know as email. And one of the problems that he had was he had to have some way of separating the user name from the host computer name. Uh, and so he had to have a symbol that was on the ASCII keyboard. But it couldn't be a symbol that was used commonly because then it would get mixed up with the names. So it had to be something that wasn't going to be found in the names. So he looked through the inventory and he said, here's one that's almost never used, the at key. So he used at. And that then became associated after email with all kinds of trendy, anything trendy and electronic digital was, was at. So you have uh, Brenda Donette's book, Cyber Play, that she wrote with the at sign. Uh, Atlanta News and Gifts, Atmosphere. Now, this has a long history. Uh, going back to 6th century Rome, uh, and in, in Latin, you had an abbreviation for AD, ad, and it was abbreviated with uh, the at sign. Uh, and then in 15th century Spain, the, the symbol was appropriated to be an abbreviation for arroba, uh, which was uh, a unit of weight that was uh, derived from the, the Arabic Arub, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, uh, Arub. Uh, and that's how we get, like for in, in French, you say Ahobaz. Uh, it's all you know, derived from, this, from Arabic, um, which was uh, about 25 kilos or 25 pounds, depending on, on the region. Uh, it was also used to, uh, for an abbreviation in 16th century Italy for amphora. These are, this, these are a series of amphoras. These were these clay containers that were used for grain, uh, oil, uh, and so forth. And then that was adopted in the Anglophone world to mean uh, the, the uh, unit price of a commodity. Uh, and that became known as commercial A. Now we've got new uses after uh, email. So in Spanish, you've got the use of the at sign to use both O and A together. So you don't have to say, Los, chicas y la, los chicos y las chicas, where you're giving you know, priority because you're mentioning chicos first, you know, and the chicas come second. Now you can just say this. Well, you can't say it. That's the problem. You have to, you can, but you can write it uh, like this. So there's a certain simultaneity. Now, the critique of this, do you know the critique of this? Well, the O subsumes the A. <laughs> So 
now we've got simultaneity, but we still do have some issues uh, to work out. Uh, now, and when we go to um, uh, forums and so forth, the at sign can be used to show that you're addressing someone in particular. So if you write at Rick, all of a sudden now, uh, this is not the whole group you're, you're addressing, but you're addressing me. Um, and then if, in, if, it, if we're talking about Twitter, uh, I could be uh, relaying a message specifically to someone uh, with this at sign. Or in Facebook, uh, you, can, you can tag messages for certain people. What's interesting about the Facebook thing is that the at sign completely disappears. I mean, you, you see it, you type it in, but then it's only the person's name. So the at sign is now no longer uh, any kind of representational symbol. It's a performative symbol. You, 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 you click on it, you do something with it, and then it's gone. But it's, it's like the button uh, that, you, that you press on. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna, that's one sign. So we're doing this in micro because it's, uh, there's not enough time to look at whole texts like this. But now we're gonna look at how, uh, instead of one sign, a whole system of signs can develop, and that's emoticons. So Scott Fallman, back in 1982, uh, when he, this was the email that invented uh, the smiley. So I proposed the following character sequence for joke markers, the smiley. Read it sideways, actually, it's probably more economical to mark things that are not jokes given the current trends. For this, use, and then, so this was the not joke marker, the serious marker. Well, that didn't catch on, but the first one did. The smiley uh, caught on big time, and it's been appropriated in different cultures in different ways. So in Japan and Korea, for example, the, the whole face, this is all with ASCII characters, of course, but the face has been rotated horizontally. So um, you've got, you know, uh, as we go down, I mean, the first one is just a uh, regular smiley. The, the second one there is for ouch. Uh, the third one with the semicolon is the cold sweat uh, running down the, the cheek. So you're embarrassed uh, about something. Um, uh, then you've got crying uh, with the tears flowing down. Uh, and then with the eyes kind of like that, you're bored. You know, it's just like, oh my gosh, this is boring. <laughs> now, what I find interesting are, the, you know, those are all facial, but now look at the body ones. So uh, the top one on, on the right, so this is bowing. This is, this is a full bow um, with the eyes down uh, and the hands uh, on the side. Uh, and then we get a side view of this too with the next one, the OTL. This is a very widely used one, especially in Korea. Does everyone recognize the OTL? This is the head, this is the arms, and then the legs uh, on the ground on all fours. So you're kneeling down. Now it can also be written with the small r and the z, and you can abbreviate it with just OZ. So there's a whole system here that's developed, and these things are used uh, very, uh, widely. Um, now, what's interesting about this also from, you know, a language learning perspective is that this is very indicative of what's important. When you look at American uh, smileys or, or just emoticons in general, what's the big thing? Well, it's the mouth. The mouth is curved up, it's curved down, it's straight across, uh, it's slanted, sometimes it's got a tongue sticking out. There, you know, these are all the standard American things. In the Japanese, emoticons, the Korean emoticons, it's the eyes. Those are what vary and that's what's important. Now there was a study that was really interesting done about two years ago that looked at why this might be. Well, the idea is that when you smile, there are real smiles and there are fake smiles and, and Americans don't make too much of a difference about it. But if you want to really see someone's emotions, you look at the eyes. Because when you smile, if it's a real smile, there'll be contractions around the eyes. If it's a fake smile, there won't be, okay? So you really have to focus in on the eyes. So for the Japanese and Korean user, users of these things, they want to focus on what's really at stake here. And so you have all these different eyes uh, that are making meaningful uh, distinctions. So 
uh, when it, and, and so they've got all kinds of studies that look at where people look in face-to-face in -face interactions when they are assessing emotion. And in fact, they find in, in uh, Japan, uh, at least, that there's very strong focus on the eyes. So it's interesting to sort of use this as a way into cultural uh, difference, how it's encoded uh, in these symbols that are developed. Now this is a new one. This is now a redesign of emoticons, taking it into a new dimension. This is light and photography. So if we were to witness a performance, we wouldn't see these because the light is moving so fast. But it, when you capture it on camera, you get the, 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 uh, the image. Now, what's in, you can't really see it here. But what's fascinating about these, these photographs is you actually see a ghost image of the woman's face as she's creating these. Her face is right there behind uh, these light images. So this is, again, a redesign of an existing pattern with the, taking this into a new artistic dimension. OK, a little bit about Greeklish. Uh, Greeklish is a ASCII system that developed in the uh, days uh, when you couldn't uh, use WorldScript on, on computers uh, and you had to use ASCII characters. And so it, uh, in Greek, uh, people started writing with Romanized text. The problem, of course, is that there are letters that don't have uh, correspondences. And so the question comes up about how do we encode uh, letters uh, in this ASCII keyboard code. And there are two main strategies. So um, here we have the word for Athens, Athena, written in, in Greek on the top. And then there is, there, we can either go with a phonological representation, where we spell it out, Athena, or we can go for an iconic representation, where the, the, the letter forms resemble graphically the uh, letters as they appear uh, in Greek. And if you look at this uh, email, this was an email that was sent out from a university. Uh, and it was, they sent out emails in both Greek and in Greeklish. Uh, because the, the thing is, is that so many people have gotten used to Greeklish for email that is become, even though they can now use Greek, uh, in fact, I have a colleague in computer engineering at Berkeley who still, to this day, writes his emails in Greek, in Greeklish, rather than in Greek, even though he can use Greek alphabet. He says, it's just the way we do it now. It's, it's just, it's stuck. And then we're used to it. Not kids. Kids use the Greek alphabet, but people of a certain age. So here, we, the, you can see how in blue, you've got the phonetic uh, encodings. And in red, you've got the graphic encodings. And so you've got a mixture of two different systems of encoding uh, this Greek. Now, what's, of course, interesting about this is the fact that it persevered after the need, the material need, came and went. But socially, it stuck. And it became conventionalized, uh, even though there was no longer any material need for it. Now, this uh, numbers and letters, of course, is used frequently. Uh, things like, I mean, we, we abbreviate, especially in texts you know, later uh, all the time. Uh, 143, what does that mean? I love you. Now, that's a different system. What is, what's the system? How do we get I love you out of that? The number of letters in the word, yeah. So I has got one letter, love has got four letters, and you has got three letters, OK? Uh, then uh, we've got 8-8. Eight, eight. Now, I've got to say, this is actually ba, ba. OK, ba, ba. Hmm? No, no, this is in Chinese. So. It is the number eight. Yeah, it is the number eight. But it sounds like the English bye bye. So this is how many writers of Chinese text will say goodbye by putting ba ba, indicating that it's like bye bye. OK. Uh, the next one, uh, but oh, I should actually add the 8-8. Eight, eight. Now we travel around the globe. 
Go to Germany. Does anyone know what this is in Germany? 8-8. Eight, eight. Neo-Nazi. Eight is the eighth, uh, a, uh, H is the eighth letter of the alphabet. And so HH is Heil Hitler. Okay. So 8-8 eight, eight is used as code in all kinds of neo-Nazi publications. So watch out where you use it uh, when you sign your uh, text messages. Um, okay. So in Korean, uh, eight is pronounced pal and uh, two is pronounced e. And so when you have eight two, eight two, uh, it becomes pali pali, which means hurry, hurry. Uh, and, then, uh, and then also in Korean, this 1004 is pronounced chionsa, uh, which means angel. So this is uh, something that's, that's, that's often used. Okay, if we go to the next column, um, so 39 and, and 3Q are the same thing, but in Japanese and Chinese. So um, does, does anyone know what these are? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right. So this is, again, this is taking a foreign accented English as the means, and you're designating it graphically through this in Japanese in the 39 and in Japanese, in, in Chinese with the san and then the letter Q. Okay, uh, 6 and 16, Italian, this is very widely used in Italian because in Italian this is se and sedici. I'm, I'm pronouncing it differently because it's, it's used in sedici, if, uh, so if you say. Uh, and then se is you. So you, you can, just like we use you in texts, they use six uh, for uh, when they're addressing uh, someone. Uh, 4A, 4A is shu a, shu a, uh, for uh, yes, yes um, in, in uh, Chinese. And then, of course, you can use numbers when you're writing in pinyin. The numbers are used not as symbols uh, phonetically, but for tones. So here we have fourth tone, first tone uh, in the expression for this way or like this. The last one I love because it depends on where you are. In Thai, do we have any Thai speakers here? Okay, so this would be ha ha ha, okay. <laughs> okay, now we need a Chinese speaker. Chinese? No Chinese speakers? Well, it's, huh? yes, yes. Woo, woo, woo. And that's crying, so. <laughs> So if you're in Thailand, 555 five, five is you're laughing. So, so the moral is you need to know the relevant system behind uh, the signs. OK, and of course, this is just a sample of some of the, the, the Chinese have run amok with these. They've even got a hit song that involves falling in love digitally. And they have all these codes <laughs> for the different words. OK. So, okay, now for the second part, uh, and this is thinking about how, um, you know, what kind, when we, when we look at this incredible morass of all these multiple systems that are out there, what do we do when we're teaching language and literacy? And so what I'm going to be talking about now are my current thoughts uh, on some ways that we could be organizing this in a principled way. So um, what, what I was shooting for here is nothing new. What I was searching for was something that is fundamental uh, and that people could, I think, generally agree on because it's relatively non-controversial. But we'll see. Uh, the goal here is not to distinguish between new literacies and old literacies because, as I've tried to point out, some of the things that happened in ancient literacies we're still doing today. The processes, the underlying semiotic principles seem to be consistent. The forms differ radically. The technical means differ radically. But the human processes that underlie that, I think, are pretty similar. So now this is on, does everyone have a copy of the handout? 
OK, so these are all on the handout. You don't need to be copying anything. Uh, I'm just going to sort of walk us through these principles uh, to talk about um, ways to think about uh, these. So the first uh, principle here, I, I, this is so small I can't see it. Oh, I can see it, OK. OK, so meanings are situated and relational, not autonomous. And the, uh, the goal would be to develop learners' awareness of how reframing and recontextualization affect meaning. OK, so if we take a word like cafe, C-A-F-E. Now, depending on where we see it, it's going to mean slightly different things. So here we have the word with, spelled out with coffee beans. We see a bag of coffee. We see a sign for where you can get your coffee. We have Café de Fleurs in Paris. We have the Loveless Motel Café. Uh, we have some abandoned cafe somewhere in, maybe outside of Tucson, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, here we have the Midpoint Cafe on Route 66, which is not a cafe at all. Then we have a tattoo of that same sign. So what does the tattoo mean differently from the sign? Well, it's radically different because it is a tattoo. But it's not pointing to the cafe, that's for sure. We know that. So it's serving a very, very different function. Then we have Café Risqué. They've dropped off the accent, I assume, unless it's Café Risque. Uh, but uh, in any event, very, very different meanings of café. Now, this is the kind of thing where you can work with your students. What does this mean? Well, all kinds of things, like pedestrian crossing, pedestrian crossing OK? Ten. Ten in Roman numerals. Multiplication. Multiplication. What else does it mean in math? Uh, and a, a, variable. a variable. OK. Jesus. 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 On the cross. Yeah. When we say Xmas, <laughs> it's Christmas, right? The spot. The spot. The spot? X marks the spot. Oh, X marks the spot. Yes. Uh, kiss. Yeah. So how does it become a kiss? Right, and the, 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 the O's are hugs, and the X is when the two, well, let's see, how do I do this? <laughs> the two mouths come together like, like that. Okay, it also can be used when you're you know, marking off a survey, you, know, you have to check the box, or if you're correcting homework, wrong. wrong. If you're seeing a film, X-rated. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We could go on and on and on about this one. And your students can too. And the idea is to sensi sensitize them to the fact that they know that these things have radically different meanings in different contexts. They don't necessarily think of it that way, but it's the case. You can also ask them questions about meaning. OK, so what's the meaning of this text? Well, what kind of meaning? So if we're talking about the, the referential uh, meaning, what is being pointed to, what is being indexed uh, by uh, this uh, text or uh, this thing that we're, that we're studying here. Uh, metaphorical, uh, are words being used literally or metaphorically? If metaphorically, uh, what is the referent being compared and what is the effect of this comparison? If we're looking at structural meaning, how does the particular ordering of words and propositions contribute to your interpretation of the text? How might a different ordering, ordering affect the meaning? How does the overall organization of the text contribute to your interpretation? Intertextual meaning. So how does this text echo other texts that you have read or heard, and what is the effect of that echoing? Uh, social meaning, what kinds of relationships are established between the author and you as reader through the language? What are the relationships that are established between the various characters through the language that is being used? Uh, what conventional meanings are attached to the genre that is being used? These are all social uh, meanings. Personal meanings. What feelings does the text evoke in you? Or what previous experiences are called to mind when you read 
this text. Um, symbolic, uh, beyond the use of metaphors, how are the text elements used in allegorical or emblematic ways? Or is the text itself, uh, can we look at it as being a symbolic act? Ideological meanings, uh, whose interests are being served by this text? Are the meanings consistent with dominant discourses, the, you know, the things that are written off as common sense, or do they run counter uh, to those dominant uh, discourses? Do they challenge them? Okay, uh, next principle, that language literacy and communication rely on both convention and invention. The idea here is that all invention requires some reliance on conventions. You can't invent out of literally thin air. And all conventions, the flip side is that all conventions originated as inventions. So whatever conventions we use, at some point they were an invention, like writing. We use writing, but at some point it was an invention. So uh, language learning involves all kinds of inventing unconventional ways of expressing things. So when my oldest daughter was very little, she used to point to things and say, have it, have it. So it was a combination of the pointing with the language, you know, because she didn't have the vocabulary for the various items. When she was older and it was visit your school day, my wife and I went to class and she says, I'm going to introduct you to the class. Okay, well, this makes a lot of sense. She's inventing a word based on introduction, which she knows. And then she said another day, it's really bad to pollutionate. <laughs> you know, this is again a very logical process of using what you've got and making the most of it. Now, it's not conventional, but it has its own internal logic. And we do this all the time when new technologies uh, come around. We create things. Look at LOL, you know, laughing out loud. Look how frequently uh, that is used. Or Greeklish. Or going back to print days, how our spellings in English derived from having to make those right margins flush. You know, oh, well, we don't have any dictionaries. So let's just take out a few letters out of that word so it'll fit. It'll, be, it'll line up nicely. Well. When it comes time to making a dictionary, what do you do? You look at the texts that are out there. So you say, okay, this is the way it's spelled. We'll put this in the dictionary. But it's not because that was a natural spelling. It was subject to all kinds of manipulations for very concrete material purposes. Okay, so reflecting on uh, conventions, thinking about this both in terms of process and in terms of product. So maybe students could keep journals about all the kinds of workarounds that they do. So in other words, deleting letters to make a, a margin flush would be a workaround. You know, you've got a constraint that you've got to work with. What other kinds of constraints do students work with? You know, when they, when they write a Twitter thing and they've got 140 characters, how do they go about deciding what's the most important thing and what can be abbreviated, what's going to be still understandable, what can I assume about my readers that they'll understand or not about the message uh, as I write it. Uh, also looking at the, you know, in terms of the product, stylistics. You know, this is, this is a, a, an age-old uh, area of scholarship that is so invaluable for looking at the nuts and bolts of language uh, looking at graphology, looking at phonology, looking at lexicon, syntax, semantics, pragmatics of texts, and paying a special attention to the aesthetic and the persuasive effects of writers' choices uh, on uh, readers. Uh, another uh, uh, goal here is using and adapting uh, conventions. In other words, to make learners aware of their agency, uh, that they're not just passive recipients of uh, conventions, uh, that they do have some agency in choosing and configuring semiotic resources. So um, one thing they might do is uh, record face-to-face 
uh, interactions and then transcribe those interactions and compare the features uh, that they find with various forms of online communication uh, and you know whether it's emails or text messages, uh, chats, video conferences, and so forth, and uh, see how their choices of forms uh, relate to the material and social dimensions of the situation. And that leads us into the third principle, the medium matters. Um, and the, the point uh, I want to make here is that uh, writing means very, very different things uh, in different mediums. So when we say we're teaching writing, well, what, what kind of writing and in what circumstances with what mediums and so forth. It's really important that we define that uh, because otherwise we may be operating at cross purposes with our students. Um, so, you know, all of these things uh, involve special skills and there's no way that all of us are going to be literate in all mediums. That's impossible. There are too many mediums out there for all of us to be fully proficient. Uh, so it's very common, in fact, it's totally normal to be much better in certain mediums uh, than in others. Um, reflecting on language forms and their material context, so uh, on the uh, micro level, and if you look at the handout, there's a table there that I've adapted from uh, Joshua Meyerowitz that goes across media that gives us all kinds of ideas for looking at writing in relation to other things. But we can, uh, you know, we as teachers can ask our students to uh, ask how performing some act, you know, apologizing or inviting uh, or breaking up with someone would be different in one medium versus another. How would you say it differently? How would you write it differently? Uh, you know, a phone call is typically unscripted and spontaneous and we get a sense of the person's immediate response while we're talking with them. A letter, we don't get that immediate response. Um, and it's not spontaneous, but by virtue of being able to plan and rewrite, we can get the tone just the way we want it. So we can craft it in a way that we can't necessarily craft the phone call. Each has their own pluses uh, and minuses, but it's very important that we know the difference. Then at the macro level, that's sort of the interactional level, but at the macro level we can think about how does all this relate to larger social practices. So for example, the telephone and business practices. How do those relate? How have our business practices changed since the development of the telephone? What about the internet? How is that affecting things? All the way from our personal relations all the way to national boundaries. How do we think about all these things in very different terms now uh, because of the internet? Comparing a, liter a literary work across different modes. So take a scene in a novel. See how it's treated, that same scene is treated in the film. See how that's, that same scene is treated in the screenplay for that film. How has the director made certain choices? If, the, if in the novel the character is speaking in free and direct discourse, so we're sort of entering the person's mind, how does the director of the film take that and show that in the film? Or does the director take a different slant altogether, uh, not trying to reproduce? You can also have students make their own films of a literary text where they, have, they themselves have to uh, make these uh, decisions. Reflecting on relationships between past and present technologies of literacy, uh, Dennis Barron has got a great book. Uh, it's in your bibliography. And one of the things he talks about there is how he gives his students lumps of clay. And he says, OK, I would like you to write a clay mail to your best friend. <laughs> and they have to, you know, they've got this lump of clay which they have to make into a tablet. And then they're forced with, OK, how do I do this? What do I include? I mean, it's got to be short because it's only going to fit in this thing and, I, you know, is it going to be legible and so forth. So uh, a colleague of mine, Gary Holland in linguistics at Berkeley, has his students, when he has this class called uh, the History of Writing uh, Systems, he has his students write in English but using other scripts. So he has them write their names in Hittite uh, to begin with uh, after they've studied Hittite, uh, then, uh, which is a cuneiform script. Then he has them write in Mycenaean Greek, 
And then he has them jump to the modern era and write in katakana, uh, Japanese script, and also in hangul, which is a Korean uh, script. So they're writing in English, but they're transcribing it through these different systems. And so they get a sense of what's involved as you work trying to keep the phonology similar, but writing in very different scripts. And of course, many languages have gone through different scripts. Uh, Turkish, for example, has been written in, in different scripts. Um, Azerbaijan, you know, these are all political decisions um, where there's a change. Um, then uh, reflecting on the relationships among mediums, social practices, and ideologies. Okay, this is, I think, a really interesting one for foreign language. So, for example, if you're studying Chinese, you know, one of the first things you're faced with is what script do you want to write in as a learner? This is, you know, I, 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 I took Chinese for a semester at Berkeley, and the first day, we're going to leave you the choice. Do you want traditional or do you want simplified? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Maybe simplify it, sounds simple. But, <laughs> but you know, what lies, it's, it's a political choice. They don't talk about the fact that you know, in, in Taiwan and Hong Kong and Macau, they have maintained traditional characters. But in the PRC, you know, with the Cultural Revolution, they instituted simplified characters so that, so that they could bring literacy to the masses. So this is a very political choice when you ask this to your students, but is that question made a political question? I mean, I think it's an interesting one to you know, talk about the sociolinguistics of these writing systems. If you are in a Hindi and Urdu class, you know, there are two scripts associated. There, there's the Nastalik and then there's the Devanagari that, that, that we saw earlier. Well, the Nastalik is, is a, a system that you write in if you're Muslim, and the Devanagari is the script you write in if you're Hindi. So you, if you write, I mean, when you speak, your religious affiliation is not evident. But once you take pen to paper, you have declared what your religious affiliation is by virtue of which script you're using. Chinese and Arabic give the impression that there is massive homogeneity among the Chinese-speaking and Arabic-speaking worlds. Well, anything but. As you look at all the varieties that are spoken in different uh, regions of the Arab world, of the Chinese-speaking uh, world, but it gives the appearance of uniformity. How most formerly colonized peoples of the world are permanently marked as such by the writing system, not necessarily the language, because oftentimes there is a you know they they use their local language, but the writing system is usually the writing system of their colonizers. And so that is something that is uh, not often talked about in language classes, but I think is a really interesting one. OK, there's a whole bunch of digital technology issues uh, that we could talk about. But in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over that. And I'm going to uh, get through, because I realize that uh, we're already 50 some minutes into this. So. Um, Fourth principle, text and communication are always multimodal. When we speak, we're not just relying on the language. We're relying on gesture. We're relying on facial expression, uh, all kinds of paralinguistic uh, phenomena. When we write, it is also multimodal. If you look at um, a handwritten letter versus a typed letter, do you see these as identical? Or do you get additional meaning from the handwriting or from the typing? I think most people would say, yes, these are actually different things, even though the words might be the same. So there's a, there is a certain multimodality that comes into play just by uh, thinking in terms of this. And then when we think about music, art, uh, and so forth. So for example, when you think of speeches, um, Martin Luther King's I Had a Dream uh, speech. OK, listen to that. Listen to the musicality of that. And then read the script of that and see if there isn't a huge difference in the meaning that you take by virtue of having heard the musicality of the present of the performance versus just the words. So um, all kinds of things that can be done to do this. You know, students can, can you know, trade uh, handwriting samples uh, anonymously and write what they think it says, what the handwriting says about the person. 
have them do some research on cultures where job letters uh, have to be handwritten, not typed. So in France, still, in the, in the business sector at least, they require handwritten lettres de motivation, you know, the cover letter. Um, in academia, I don't think they do, but, but uh, you know, there's a sense that you, you can sense something about the person through the handwriting. And so they send these out to graphologists to, to, uh, to analyze. Uh, developing rhetorical skills in a range of modes. Thinking of how language interacts with music, sound, visual design in theater. I mean, a lot of our students in languages are studying theater. How it operates in film, other multimodal modes of expression like digital storytelling and so forth. Um, all super important. Uh, and then uh, uh, awareness of code uh, and digital environments. I think this is an important thing. I won't go into this right now, but basically, there are so many ethical questions tied to this, questions of responsibility uh, that get brought up. For example, when you have an interface that uh, requires anonymity, uh, what kinds of phenomena that may be negative are coming out of that, like cyberbullying and uh, stalking and flaming and so forth. Um, the fifth principle uh, is bringing all this together by looking at how uh, language technologies and texts are relational interfaces through which we see the world and how the world uh, comes to us. Uh, and that uh, because they mediate, these technologies mediate between us and the social world, they ask us to be certain things and to act certain ways when we interact uh, with them. So for example, if we compare books uh, with lectures, with online forums, um, hybrid conferences, all of these things uh, give us certain options, uh, curtail other options, and it's important that we think about all the different elements that go into uh, these different interfaces and how they allow power to circulate differently. So for example, in a lecture, here I am talking for an hour, and you guys aren't saying much. Uh, I'm the one who's controlling the discourse while I'm the speaker. Once I sit down, no longer the case. So it's not me the person, it's me the role taker. In a book, it's very different. You respond uh, privately, and you can also respond publicly, but it's not going to be in the book itself. It's going to be in some other means, such as a journal article, an online forum, an email, uh, et cetera. Uh, so, um, and online forums, when we type things, whether I'm typing, you're typing, all of our type is the same. It all looks the same. So there's an equalizing, horizontalizing, uh, leveling effect. Um, uh, and so each of these technologies, each of these particular situations is going to ask us to do certain things uh, in different ways than we would do them in other uh, mediums and situations. Uh, evaluating the authenticity and validity of information. This is a, a huge topic. Um, I'll just say that it's super important to have students critically assess uh, the authenticity and validity um, of the things that they read and know what to uh, make of it. Uh, recognizing how people create uh, social identities. Every time we use language, we are creating a certain social identity. Sometimes we're not aware of it. In fact, probably most of the times we're not aware of it. When we handwrite something, we are creating a certain social identity. Um, and it's important that students take stock of this and think about how they are doing this and how other people uh, are doing it. And then finally, uh, acknowledging uh, fully the importance of aesthetic dimensions uh, in text, what Roman Jakobson called the poetic function of language, uh, that, that we have visceral responses to what happens that may not be semantic, but they are real responses that uh, have huge importance in the ways that we interpret text, and yet because they're not semantic, they don't get addressed on the same level. 
And so uh, it's important that we develop a meta uh, vocabulary, I think, for talking about these visceral responses um, to uh, language and texts. And style is, of course, uh, very crucial there, as I mentioned before. So um, on your handout, you've got a number of heuristic questions that summarize uh, all this material um, in a set uh, of trying to establish uh, a mindset uh, among the students. Again, the idea being that we're not looking at, when we teach languages, not always just things, items that we teach, but we're looking at the relationships among those items. And that's what I'm trying to stress when I call it a relational pedagogy. We're focused on the in-between of, of the various items uh, that we teach and how they interrelate, not just on the items themselves as such. Uh, so to conclude, um, I just want to say that you know, one of the points that I've tried to make is that the interaction of material, social, and individual uh, factors plays out differently in different contexts of communication across different situations of technological mediation and across different moments in history. Yet by taking a broad perspective, I think we can see that many of the new literacy practices that we see around us in the computer age still strive to address the fundamental problem faced by our ancestors, and that is how to design visible acts of communication in ways compatible with sociocultural, material, and individual resources and constraints. And I think that uh, by understanding uh, communication practices in relation to uh, those associated with past media, we can improve our theoretical understanding of how people adapt symbolic forms and functions to various material media as well as to their social needs. And I think this is super important on a practical level uh, when we're talking about language and literacy education. Um, so it, thinking in terms of uh, theoretically sound uses of technology in education is one area that I think can be informed by this. And the other is uh, informing our teaching of reading and writing uh, and language use that takes multiple material, symbolic, and cultural contexts into account. So that's, in a nutshell, uh, what this is uh, trying to do. I think these, these are the things, these are the basic principles that will best prepare our students for the 21st century and beyond, uh, not because we're forecasting what the new technologies are going to be, but because we're focusing on what has always been and what will continue to underlie whatever new technologies come along in the future. So with that, I thank you and welcome any questions or feedback. I just had a question. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, thank you very much for a very intellectually stimulating and, and rewarding um, mm -hmm. talk. I really look forward to uh, the publication and more work in this area. Um, I just noticed the pedagogical goals. One of the things that you um, bring in a lot is a sort of reflection, mm -hmm. meta, meta awareness, uh, these are metacognition awareness uh, sort of principles. Um, when we're working with say, uh, lower proficiency learners, um, how can we design an activity that may be asking students to do these kinds of comparison, sort of upper level um, activities that may really, I think, require access to higher vocabulary, and should it be in, you know, the target language, or is it okay to think about, you know, other ways of doing that sort of reflection? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that, um, what you have to focus on is getting them reflecting about things that they know really, really well. Um, so whatever um, hobbies, practices, uh, you know, ways that they use language, the things that they do really well already, are the th I think, are the places you want to start. And to get them talking about that 
and developing your own, it can be your own meta language. It doesn't have to be, you know, buying into some established uh, set of terms, but, you know, getting the, the concept of meta language established, that then once it's established in your classroom, you can make a bridge between, you know, how other people have talked about similar phenomena and they call it such and such. So that step by step, you're, you're starting with their own experience, which is infallible. Uh, and then uh, getting them to come up with these, with these when, I, when I say infallible, I mean in the sense of something that they know deeply. Uh, and, and that where, because if you, ask, if you ask them, you know, talk about this poem, you know, um, you know, with meta language, it's like, I'm no expert on poetry, you know, I'm just in this class, you know, but so they feel very insecure, you know, but, but if you get them talking about something that they really know, um, you'll start to see a certain meta vocabulary coming up, which can then become shared in the class, which is modeling the whole process of how meta language gets developed in the first place. Someone, you know, talks about an experience and then in sharing it, there is an analytical process that then creates a meta vocabulary among that, in that community. They're doing it right then and there. Then the question is just, you know, making those bridges so that they can see how what they've developed relates to what other people have developed so that it's not just their own uh, idiosyncratic language in the classroom. Thank you very much for your talk. I, mm -hmm. I always get very happy when I see the aesthetic in mm -hmm. models like this. And so I was going to ask if you could comment a little bit on the aesthetic as, as a sort of more conventional aspect, so the kinds of forms or practices that we, we value and evaluate to be good together, and the aesthetic as a more personal reaction, and where you see those playing a, a role in this kind of pedagogy. Yeah. Well, by conventional, you're talking about um, sort of prize-winning aesthetics. So in other words, things that, that win prizes. Is that, is that what you mean by? To, to an extent or that a particular social group ag agrees are good or legitimate or authorized in some way. Yeah, yeah. So, so for, yeah, for, so a, a literature class is a, is, is a great way to get into that because you're, you're, you're taking usually canonical texts that have, that are, that have been recognized by the culture as being great for w one reason or another. Uh, and uh, in almost all, you know, those canonical texts, there is going to be a very rich um, use uh, of language that, that students may have a hard time getting into at first, but when shown what's operating behind the scenes, can take incredible pleasure uh, in. Um, so I think, you know, the, 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 the trick there is what's involved in the door opening. Um, thinking about, you know, and, you know, us thinking about as a profession, you know, what are the kinds of things that really uh, are effective in, in getting students to open and walk through that door and see what's on the other side. Uh, because I think that, you know, there are a lot of great ideas about how to do that. Um, on the personal side, uh, I would look at their own, the aesthetics of their own language, you know, uh, whether it's, uh, whether their, their, their speech, their, their writing, Facebook exchanges are great. I was going to show you, I, I realized that this thing was going to be too long and so I cut out all these slides, but I've got these great slides of three young women uh, on Facebook who are Egyptian uh, and they are um, using uh, colloquial Arabic, sta modern standard Arabic, and English. Um, but they're doing it in very aesthetic ways uh, and in ways that will produce humor among themselves. So, for example, when they use English, they always, you know, they use the word probably and they say probably because the P doesn't exist in Arabic and so they, they inflect their English writing with the sound patterns, pretending that, you know, all three of them speak English beautifully. So it's not as if they go around saying probably. They all say probably, <laughs> just like I do. But when they're writing, 
they play on their affiliation with their Egyptianness too. And so they are presenting themselves in this uh, hybrid Egyptian identity, which is very aesthetic. I mean, it's language play, uh, which I actually, I had a whole bunch on language play too, which I, I took out too. But uh, that's you know, super important to, to get students realizing that you know, aesthetics is not just for the Nobel Prize winning you know, Patrick Modiano's in the world, uh, but for rank and file everybody in the world. I mean, everybody uh, ha invokes a certain literariness in their language use, uh, no matter how humble you know, the, 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 the surroundings and so forth. So uh, I think the more that students can be aware of that presence of that, that, that aesthetic dimension um, that they already partake in but don't necessarily realize. I think that's uh, an important thing. Another question. I think you've helped answer a question for you that I've had ever since the new literacies work came out. Is that the claim was always made that there's new knowledge new ways of thinking, there's a newness. And you had put one of the classic, you know, Greek, you know, identification of knowledge, techne, the other is episteme, the other is phronesis. So one of my questions, as you pointed out, is that if communication's always been multimodal, always, then is there a newness? I mean, a newness in a category of knowledge philosophically. Or are we just always capitalizing on what human beings can always do, but that our age now is kind of like, it's almost like it's a, there's a certain singularity and density to what we have now in terms of communication. But in terms of yeah. new knowledge, in a philosophical sense, or categories of knowledge or whatever, I wonder if that's so. Sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, think that your speech says there really is human beings have been doing this. Well, I, I don't think I'd say that about knowledge, uh, because I think with each tool, um, there are going to be certain epi epistemological questions that we've never thought of that, that all of a sudden, you know, come to light. Uh, so, for example, uh, the latest Nobel Prize, you know, uh, where they were, where they're now able to film molecular action as it's occurring in cells. I mean, the fact that you can now visualize that, I think is gonna open up a whole new raft of questions about cell behavior, uh, about genetic, uh, genetics that, that were never you know, available for questioning before because it was all invisible. So I think that you know, the literal bringing to light of these phenomena are going to, I think, have probably down the, down the road um, lots of, you know, um, open up lots of avenues for new knowledge generation. Certainly, we see incredible change in the dissemination of knowledge through the internet. Um, access to uh, knowledge that was not at all accessible before unless you had a library card, uh, if you had a local library. Uh, even then, most of these things would, not, would never have been available. The things that now if you have a cell phone, uh, you can access you know, in, in many, many parts of the world um, with, that have no libraries, you can access very, very um, large amounts of sophisticated information, you know, from about all kinds of subjects. You know, uh, 50 years ago wasn't the same way. So, I mean, I think that's a big thing. Um, the fact that the individual can be contributing uh, to our knowledge base in a way that's unprecedented. Uh, you know, if you uh, put out something on the internet as an individual, you have published it and you may have millions of readers uh, just by virtue of having uh, an internet account. Uh, unheard of um, 
as, as little as 50 years ago where you had to have something published and then you would rely on uh, a certain um, class of reader that would be exposed to your material. So I think that's been a radical change. The, the very makeup of uh, text by, by being digital and being able to be transformed uh, through digital algorithms um, brings to light new dimensions in databases. I mean, so I think that there are, there are new things under the sun. But what I was trying to get across was the idea that when it comes to communication, um, and particularly visual communication, um, I think a lot of the fundamentals of where we are now are not that different from the fundamentals of um, you know, 5,000 years ago uh, in terms of not the specifics, but in terms of how social, individual, and material dimensions all need to be taken into uh, uh, account by people as they, as they communicate. So that's sort of the, the I guess, the universalist um, angle. But I, I think that there are um, certainly new avenues uh, opened up by, by technology that, that will produce phenomenal amounts of, of new knowledge as we go forward. I've been informed we have uh, time for about two more questions. Yeah, um, I mean, I say yeah. I mean, I mean, <laughs> no. <laughs> and the reason no is because uh, which 21st century? I mean, I mean, the students today are yes, they're in the 21st century, but uh, that doesn't. I don't think that means much uh, when it comes to looking at brass tacks reality of what students. I mean, I think students are so radically different as you move from one, um, I mean, I'll, you know, certainly uh, culture, as you move from one culture uh, to the next, but even, um, you know, on a far more local level. I mean, I, I think that, that um, one of the challenges is working with the incredible, I mean, on the one hand, it's an incredible richness, the heterogeneity that students bring. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think that, that there's more, um, well, it is again heterogeneity, but now in the sense of when you're working on a particular, when you're teaching a particular course, you can no longer assume that, it, that all the students know certain things. Um, and so that's you know, a challenge too, that the things that in the past you could sort of assume uh, were common knowledge, shared knowledge, socially distributed, um, is not always that way. So I think that's you know, one, of the, one of the things that we have to be, you know, sort of take stock of. OK, so what are the fundamentals that we're going to be dealing with? And maybe we can you know, share that knowledge. You, you know, can share that knowledge uh, about what these fundamentals are so that we can then build on that. So I think it's very diff I think your question is well taken because it's very difficult to generalize about what the 21st century student is like. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even in terms of technology, not all students text and are, you know, digital wizards. And uh, at Berkeley, we still get students who are completely uh, technologically naive. They, you know, um, and and certainly, 15 years ago, there were lots and lots and lots of students like that. So. Even you know all the, the myths about students all being super proficient in terms of computers and so forth, not necessarily. I think there's very little we can count on. Okay, I think we have our last question here. Thank you. Um, I work in the library, mm -hmm. and we now buy more e-books than mm -hmm. we do print books. And even though the content of an e-book and a print book might be identical, the experience for the reader is very, very different. 
And so there have been some studies where you know, there's deeper learning with print books. On the other hand, with the e-books, there's a search function that you don't have with print. Um, my question is how you see the, the switch over to e-books affecting learning. Well, first of all, I don't see it as a switch. I don't think we're going to abandon print books anytime in the near future. I mean, that's just my own uh, take on that. But I, I don't think, I think e-books are going to be a supplement to, but I don't think they're going to actually replace uh, paper books. I've been thinking a lot about this recently because, you know, my publisher is going to be putting out, you know, in my contract it says, you know, it's mostly e-books. You know, that's what they want to do is e-books because it's cheap. Um, but it's got, yeah, you're right, it's got all kinds of features that you don't get, you know, in, in, in print books. So I think, you know, different people are going to buy different products. And I think that um, uh, some people are going to, you know, read one in one format and then maybe read it in another format. I mean, especially a print book that they might then uh, reread in an ebook format because there are different things you can do uh, with the ebook. You know, you can, you can, you know, by, by virtue of being able to search, you can juxtapose passages uh, in ways that you can't do with the print volume very easily. I mean, it's very tedious to do that with the print volume. Um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, uh, I, th I certainly think that, that young people today are getting more and more and more comfortable with doing all their reading on screens. Um, I, I can't do that <laughs> myself. I get, my eyes get tired doing that, but, uh, and I can't mark it the same way and so forth. But, you know, I'm old, so, but <laughs> the, uh, the youngsters, they're, they're all about screens. So I think, you know, e-books make a lot of sense. But I mean, I think, I think the question is, you know, in, in the library science class, for example, would be to compare what's the experience of reading an e-book uh, versus reading a leather-bound book, um, there are going to be differences. What are they? And then what do we tell students when they come in to check out materials? I think that, that's, the, that's the key thing. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I, this is really a, a great conference. I hope that uh, the dialogue on the sessions this past week will continue because I'm totally excited about this this uh, notion that the commentary remains after uh, the discussion of these online projects. So good luck uh, with that. <laughs>